So Pathak Patel from um, Informatica is going to walk us through all their DevSecOps stuff. So thank you all for your patience. And I will back Great. Away. Thank you for introducing. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, today we are here to talk about how Informatica has built the DevSecOps practices uh, into AWS with the help of Red Hat ACS, Advanced Cluster Security. <coughs> A uh, little bit about myself, I'll start with that. Um, so currently, I'm with Informatica. Uh, I've been here for past six years and few months. Uh, before that, I worked for Netflix and Yahoo, uh, currently focused on uh, Kubernetes. That's, that's one of the things that my team works on primarily as of these days. Uh, we, are, we are a security engineering team mainly focused on it. Uh, all of you can reach out to me uh, on Twitter at Pathikpa, that's my handle. Uh, and uh, let's now uh, uh, take a little bit information about Informatica as well. So we are uh, 1.44 billion in revenue as of today. Uh, <clears throat> Informatica has been around for a long time, about 27 years. A uh, lot of you folks uh, have, may have used it and heard about it already. <clears throat> as of today, Informatica offers uh, intelligent data management cloud, uh, our customers use uh, our uh, data management cloud to do API integration, data integration, data quality, data governance, master data management, and many other things around how, how enterprises are building their data-driven organizations. Uh, our cloud processes 32 trillion transactions per month, and all of these services are hosted in the Kubernetes. Uh, and our Kubernetes is also hosted on multi-cloud, so we uh, use uh, all the clouds, uh, like all three major clouds, AWS, Azure, Google. Uh, but today we will uh, focus uh, on how we are using ACS within uh, AWS. Uh, so to start with, uh, I wanted to provide my opinion on what does DevSecOps means for me. <clears throat> um, Everybody has their own opinion, how they run their organization, how their culture is, and all that. Um, so from my point of view, when development team, security team, and operations team, they are coming together and building their environment uh, in a singular fashion such that they, can, they are moving at the same speed. So that's, that's the main goal, and this is the goal that my security engineering team also follows. Uh, as a security engineering team, we are there to help out our development and operations team to ensure that we are taking care of security as a one group rather than operating individually. <clears throat> um, also, uh, all of us who are operating in the cloud, uh, we have heard that security is a shared responsibility. So on that, DevSecOps enables a shared security mindset for everybody. Uh, this is where uh, a development team understands what are the guardrails, how those guardrails are uh, interpreted in the development, build, and uh, production deployment environment. Um, so security team helps out uh, defining these guardrails and then helping them implement with the help of development and operations team on the shift left. So these are the gates that we are building to ensure that when our uh, development team is building their code, operations team is pushing that code out from the build to production environment, they are given a continuous feedback on how their uh, software piece of code is doing and what are the checks they are passing and failing and how to improve upon those checks. So that's, that's what uh, our DevSecOps op opinion, my DevSecOps opinion is. Um, all of the next slides are mo mostly focused on this opinion that I want to enable my uh, development organization to be successful from the security point of view. So uh, before we jump further into various practices, I also want to take a quick look at uh, life cycle, how we see DevSecOps life cycle at Informatica. Uh, it is very uh, similar to uh, what we <clears throat> typically see in the traditional DevOps. So it starts with uh, planning and development, but security, it adds few of the checks or guardrails, such as like threat modeling, peer reviews, coding reviews, and so on. 
Uh, and when the code gets committed, it's a further uh, down the road, uh, and this is where we are doing a uh, static application security testing, dependency management, secure, secure pipeline, and so on. So in the uh, security testing, we want to ensure that any code that is being checked in, uh, it, whether it is a Python, Java, or a, even a Terraform or Cloud Formation code, that is meeting the security standards and it is compliant to uh, our definition of the guardrails. And then moving on to build and test, this is again next phase where security tools are integrated with your uh, 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 build systems, whether it's a Jenkins, CI, uh, Circle CI, Harness, or any other uh, build, build tools that you are using. And here, uh, the security checks are extended to the next level where we are also making sure that the artifact or binary that is being built, it is meeting to the standard of our uh, compliance and security requirements. So here, uh, we focus on the configuration scans. Uh, so what this means is how, con how this binary is configured and when it goes into production, what, what configuration it will take with it. Like we are trying to verify those. And then comes the ships and ship and deploy. Uh, again, uh, in ship and deploy uh, phase, we are running uh, further checks that we define in the build and test, but this is more of a validation that what we define in the build environment, is it the same in the production environment or not? And if it is not, how do we, uh, how do we give up, provide a feedback to our deployment team on what's, what's wrong, what is the drift, and uh, what went wrong? Uh, and the last one is the monitor. This is a continuous monitoring, so uh, looking out for any drifts in your uh, uh, running environment and uh, running your vulnerability scans and providing feedback to uh, your development and operations team so that next cycle, next build cycle, next development cycle is fixed and improved. Um, so as we go further and look into different things, uh, I want to just uh, take a break here to explain what tools we'll be talking about. So first one is Amazon EKS. So Informatica uses Amazon EKS very heavily as our managed Kubernetes engine. Uh, then we have Amazon ECR. Uh, this is where we store our uh, container registries. Um, and then we use uh, Red Hat ACS, Advanced Cluster Security, for securing our Kubernetes environment and providing the feedback to our development uh, lifecycle. And then Jira is our ticketing and workflow management tool to ensure that all of these uh, systems that can be plugged together in a one workflow and uh, uh, is, is completing cycle through the workflow man uh, feedback point of view. So, uh, as we go uh, uh, detailed into what, what we should do from the DevSecOps perspective, I want to start with some of the best practices that we, uh, we think about when we are deploying our Kubernetes environment. Um, so some of the things are like segregating your repositories. We'll talk about all of these uh, items further into next slides. But segregating your repositories into dev, production, staging, so that you have clear delineation between what code is written uh, in the development environment, what is built, and what is running in the production. Uh, also, make sure that you are using a distroless container images. So typically, tradi uh, or traditionally, we have been all using um, publicly available operating systems such as Red Hat, CentOS, Ubuntu, and taking that in and on top of it, putting our binaries or artifacts and running those in the production environment. But those system comes with a lot of burden a uh, lot of packages that are not necessary, and so uh, distroless images like Alpine Linux is very helpful here. Uh, also, we use admission controllers heavily to ensure that we are securing our environment from the get-go, from the first entry point. Uh, enable your audit logs for Kubernetes. Uh, this is uh, helping out both in the security and uh, debugging uh, point of view. Uh, segregate your security controls from the build time and runtime uh, perspective. Uh, also, uh, adopt service mesh. Uh, this is for optimal routing and encryption, and it also aids in your security visibility as well, like which ports, which applications are talking to which uh, other applications and ports, and how their network uh, traffic is encrypted and segmented. 
And lastly, uh, 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 implement CI scans. So CI scans, there are three different uh, um, verticals into it. One is for containers, your Docker container, how they are configured from the CS perspective, your worker nodes, and your clusters. Um, so uh, we talked about uh, segregating uh, your uh, repositories. So I'll go a little bit uh, deeper into what I mean by that, uh, why I'm talking about segregation. So here on the first bucket, we have uh, the development uh, uh, environment. So this is where a developer, developer is writing their code and committing that into a container, basically building out a container image. Uh, that can then be uh, used further in the development cycle. So when a developer is putting this into uh, on his own uh, local desktop, we enable them with a local uh, binary. This is this uh, this is actually a command line utility that is provided by ACS that our developers are using to scan their local container images. And using uh, this scan, they are able to uh, understand what are the dependencies and what are the third party libraries or various libraries that are used and what type of vulnerabilities exist in those libraries. So this is the early feedback system where they are able to look at their own code, their own container. And from that point of view, they understand that here are what, here are what I have written, here are my libraries and this is what I need to fix. So once uh, they are happy, uh, they have patched all of their uh, issues, all the vulnerabilities, they put that into a dev repository. This is a, a labeling system that we have <coughs> internally implemented so that developer checks in their uh, containers into the dev repository. After that, when they are ready to go into QA cycle, it goes, it, 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 those uh, containers are promoted to the uh, QA repository. And our CI CD pipeline, it only accepts container from this QA repository. So all the all of our build pipeline, they are only accepting it from the QA and using that, they are building this environment. So they, uh, uh, in the CI CD pipeline, this container images, they will be uh, 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 various YAML files, policy files, that would be defined and using that, the final build is put out. And this build is also uh, uh, verified using various CI scans, uh, Reddit ACS scans. And once that is according to the satisfy, uh, satisfactory requir requirements, it will be then checked into the staging environment. And uh, QA cycle goes on through multiple cycles. And after the final release candidate is published, that final release candidate then gets into the staging environment. And this, uh, this final release candidate is then used to deploy into our production Kubernetes cluster. So uh, we'll, um, uh, as, we, um, as we go into the whole life cycle, uh, how, we are, how we have integrated it, so uh, to put it in, into perspective, our dev container, it goes into AWS ECR. This is where our staging or QA or dev repository comes in. Jenkins, which is the tool that we are using for our build pipeline, it picks it, picks it up from the ECR and builds its uh, whole artifactory binaries. And this binaries will be scanned by Red Hat ACS for vulnerability issues, uh, CS compliance issues. And this compliance issues or any of the vulnerabilities or compliance issues are now collected by Jira and uh, tickets will be created in the uh, QA uh, uh, project to ensure that QA team can take a look, validate it, and request a bug fixes for that. <clears throat> and this cycle, as I was mentioning, multiple QA cycle goes through and after those QA cycle, um, the release candidate will be promoted to the staging environment. Um, so again, going over the build time security, uh, as I mentioned previously, like digitalized images are a very important factor here. Um, at Informatica, we heavily use Alpine Linux as our digitalized uh, image, and even some of the legacy tools that we have or legacy application 
where we have mandate of Red Hat or CentOS uh, type of operating system. We have taken that uh, operating system, taken that image, and reduced it down uh, to whatever the minimum things that we need. So when I say reduce, uh, we are removing any package managers, any network utilities, uh, file system modification utilities. There are all this, uh, we call it a bloatware, uh, that is not required to run your container. We remove uh, it from uh, our environment, and we have slimmed those uh, uh, images down to 80 MBs so that we are running the minimum uh, uh, operating system in our environment. Uh, then as we, uh, as I mentioned, like uh, enable tooling for developers to able to scan their code and their container in their local desktop environment um, and provide like integrations, uh, help them uh, build out a pipeline so they are encouraged to look at their issues in their development uh, cycle. Uh, integrating ACS with Jenkins CI/CD for continuous feedback during the build time. Uh, scanning at uh, uh, dev time and promoting to QA. Uh, scanning in also CI pipeline as well. Uh, so this is, again, like we previously talked about it in our, uh, 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 in our pipeline uh, design. Uh, and all of this can, is only possible if you have stronger uh, block around like what, where your build system accepts your images from. So we are uh, locking it down to the compliant repositories only, and uh, this is achieved by uh, specifying specific labels that are accepted during the build time. Now, moving on to the runtime security, this is a very similar setup using Red Hat ACS. Um, so uh, when our uh, container images that they, go, they get deployed into the Amazon EKS, uh, Reddit ACS is deployed, the sensor is deployed in all of our cluster, each one of the clusters, uh, and this is part of our or orchestration layer as well. So orchestration layer will put up, uh, will install um, Reddit ACS sensors on all the clusters, and using those sensors, we are implementing the continuous scans. These continuous scans are uh, doing multiple things. The first one is uh, vulnerability scans, uh, second one uh, is the CIS scans at, for the Docker images, uh, CIS scans for the Kubernetes environment. Uh, the third thing it is checking is various policies that we have defined in our Red Hat ACS for uh, measuring the risk of particular deployments. Uh, on top of it, we also have a custom uh, policies defined in our admission controller as well uh, that enforces various uh, RBAC related, privileges related rules. And also it ensures that none of the vulnerable container that get deployed into the production environment. Uh, along with that, admission controller is also uh, making sure that our uh, uh, deployment is only coming from the prod repositories, and nobody can deploy it from any open repositories uh, outside of Informatica's purview. So we have a lot of uh, open repositories like available by Docker, Red Hat, Quai, etc. Uh, and also many of the vendors uh, they maintain their own repositories as well. But at Informatica, we block out uh, those repositories to ensure that only approved code goes into the production. Uh, and this is achieved using the admission controller policies. <clears throat> uh, so in the runtime, uh, some of the controls that, uh, specific controls that we have implemented is first is enforcing, enforcing the namespace usage. Uh, so namespace usage allows us to build out a segregation between products and business entities. And this is where uh, this segregation is ultimately helping out uh, to enforce role-based access control uh, between pods, uh, uh, pods and also the various application. And the same uh, namespace uh, um, segregation is used to define the network policies and uh, our service mesh policies on how, which namespace, which pods can talk to uh, which other namespaces and pods. Uh, along with that, admission controller, uh, it is our central point 
uh, central enforcement point, which is enforcing all the guardrails that we have defined, uh, uh, which is like uh, port security policies, we, uh, uh, deployment must have their network policies associated during the deployment, uh, how API servers can be used, can it be used from the external uh, uh, clients, uh, how it is used from uh, internal uh, environment, who can query the API servers. So all of this is uh, put into the admission controller. And in the last, uh, uh, monitoring the configuration to detect uh, CS compliance failures. So one of the things that we, we may assume that once uh, our Kubernetes environment is deployed, it is expected that Kubernetes uh, system itself will keep monitoring this environment and uh, do the self-healing. But many times we have seen that this self-healing self uh, has a failure due to the local changes that may be implemented by the uh, uh, Kubernetes admin. And from the security point of view, we want to detect these changes and report it back into uh, uh, our operations uh, team. Along with that, uh, this configuration also allows us to monitor for any rogue containers. Um, like uh, people will be surprised that how can rogue containers get into the Kubernetes environment when most of the things are managed by orchestration or orchestrator or uh, your de uh, local de uh, deployment system. But even with all of that, we have seen that people, uh, uh, the deployments, uh, they don't do a uh, proper cleanup. And many times we have seen this rogue container, which may be used for testing purposes or uh, temporary purposes, and then they never got cleaned up. So can this configuration monitoring allows us to detect this type of uh, rogue containers. Now, uh, this build time and runtime security that we talked about, but at the end of the day, we have to figure out that what we are achieving, like how do we uh, get a single pane of view? And for single pane of view, uh, we have defined this risk lens that allows us to figure out that what is the risk profile of each of the deployment that we have in our uh, running uh, uh, Kubernetes environment. And to define this risk lens, we have multiple, uh, multiple verticals that we have defined. The first one is images. Uh, so as we talked about, like, what are the images? Are those uh, approved images coming from the approved repositories? Um, uh, are there any rogue images that are running in the environment? Uh, then the access control. Access control around, like, who are the admins? Uh, uh, what are the access that each of the containers has? in the Kubernetes environment. Uh, the next one is network policies. Uh, who can talk to whom? Uh, also for the pod security policy is also a part of this. Um, and then uh, the cluster security itself, like how clusters are configured, what are the CIS parameters configured for them, and are they meeting those CIS parameters or not? Um, so as we, um, as we have defined those guardrails, we codified these guardrails into the um, Red Hat ACS. So here I have uh, popped up a sim uh, one of the sample risks that was identified by Red Hat ACS. So if you look at here closely, um, here it is defining all the policy violations. So one of our policies says that if there is a, a container that has any vulnerability that has CVSS score greater than seven, then that should not uh, get deployed. Or if it is deployed and a vulnerability is detected afterwards, then it's a policy violation and we need to flag it out. Uh, similar to that, uh, here's the process with UID zero. So this is an example of RBAC policies failure. Uh, and similar to that, uh, secret mounted as environment variable. So this is a big no-no from um, CIS. Uh, so it's a CIS policy failure as well. So these are the combination of the policies that we have identified, and ultimately these policy uh, failures are um, uh, calculated under the risk, and that is the priority. Based on that, we have defined the priorities which will allow our developers and the operations team to prioritize their workload and figure out what items do we need to fix first. So one of the good examples is that priority will go higher 
if the fixable CVSS score uh, greater than seven is is there is present. Uh, but uh, if there is a Docker CS failure, then we may not prioritize it at that high level because Docker CI is not all of the controls uh, uh, are um, approachable or ex expected to meet in our environment. So we have put it at a lower priorities. So based on this uh, priority based decision, we are feeding uh, this data back into our development uh, team's lifecycle using JIRA tickets. And in the last, uh, um, the DevSec, uh, like DevSec ops takeaways that I want to mention here. Uh, so the first one is uh, define guardrails and document them. So these guardrails are ultimately helpful for everybody to uh, be on the same page. Uh, when you define them and document it, it is very likely that your development team and operations team will go through it and underst uh, to understand and figure out like how those guardrails will be implemented in the different stages of uh, the DevSecOps lifecycle, like whether this guardrail is at the code commit level, build level, or the ship level. Um, and once you have documented this, um, it's pretty easy to put them into uh, ACS. So most of the guardrails that we have defined, they either go into ACS or admission controllers. And using th those two systems, we are able to ensure that all of our Kubernetes deployment will fall into uh, our standards and the requirements. And uh, once you have the guardrails, one of the, uh, one of the main advantages is using these guardrails, you are able to provide uh, feedback to developers. So this is also very important. Um, you want to create your own uh, system uh, using whatever ticketing system that you are using uh, so that the issues that are identified by admission controllers or Red Hat ACS goes back into the, into the development lifecycle. This will allow security to move to the shift left and uh, reduce your security issues in the production environment. And uh, when I say reduction, one of the major thing uh, that we have uh, experienced is Kubernetes amplifies your problems. Because in the past, when you were running like 1,000 virtual machines and uh, running your uh, products or applications using that, now those thousands of uh, virtual machines are multiplied by 1,000 containers. So uh, all your vulnerabilities, all your use, uh, issues are multiplied by 1,000. So, uh, this is one of the things that uh, uh, is important to keep in mind and to, to control this, you want to ensure that you have broader mindset work. So when you provide your early feedback to developers, uh, they will be uh, sharing your load, they will be working for you to fix the security issues early on. And at the end, uh, build your automations to provide reporting. Uh, it's certainly a good idea to put your issues in the JIRA, but then you also want to uh, build out your uh, reporting system, your dashboards and charts to ensure that you can uh, provide a, a routine feedback to the leaders on how we are doing as a security, organi as a security minded organization. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the uh, final slide. Uh, any questions? Yes, yes, awesome. Um, we do have one question from the virtual side of the house. Uh, sure. And he's asking, are third-party OCI images being signed after scanning? Are third-party OCI images are signed? Yes, uh, so as uh, I was mentioning that we are bringing in all of our images into our, our own ECR. And so before checking into ECR and during the uh, 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 storage pro uh, uh, process, we do sign it. So we have our own uh, notary that uh, is used to sign those images. Cool, thank you. All right, Great. anyone else have a couple of questions? Yep, here we go. Thank you everyone. Hey, I have a question here. Yeah, sure. Hey, this is here. So sometimes there will be some containers, like init containers, which come and go very fast. Mm -hmm. So will it also scan that? 
Um, so those init containers, yes, it, so during the runtime, it probably won't get scanned. Uh, so uh, one of the reason is we uh, have uh, scheduled the continuous scan for ACS every four hours. So yes, uh, during the runtime, they won't get scanned, but they will certainly get scanned during the build time. So we know what uh, like dependencies, what are the configuration from the Docker CS point of view. So at least we have validation during the uh, development time and build time. Okay, you're saying that you know even before the container runs during the build time, that scan will happen and it captures that if something is is wrong. Is wrong, correct. And if, if that pass didn't get checked, it won't go further. It will fail there. Yes, correct. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. All right, and one more from the ether, uh, the virtual world. Is there a plan to migrate from the use of pod security policies to pod security admission controller or something? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So um, we uh, haven't yet found, uh, or we have invested a lot into pod security policies as of today. Uh, so uh, the network policy, that is something that we are looking at, but uh, as of right now, no. It's, it's mostly investment issue, like we have invested in, uh, invested in resources, so don't have time to go into the next one right now. Yep. Uh, could you re-explain the, um, the pipeline that you was talking about when you said that, <clears throat> that you had to create separate repositories? Mm -hmm. Um, are you, those repositories created beforehand or are they created after the workflow or during the workflow? It's, it's created beforehand. Uh, and uh, also we have a document that outlines what are the tags and labels that should be used, uh, so versioning system. Uh, so that also helps us, like basically uh, repository names are specific uh, based on our naming standards. Did that answer? That was a good answer. Right. That was a good answer. All right, we're gonna wrap it up here, and thank you very much for coming. Absolutely, and, uh, thank you. That was awesome.